Cool. Welcome everyone here in the reactor and on the stream. Nice to see so many people uh, interested in databases. I'll admit I was nervous. Maybe you know databases isn't like cool. Maybe there's so many different other things we could talk about, Web3 and uh, you know front-end development, and that will get people excited. But nice to see there's a lot of excitement here uh, for a, I think will be a very educational uh, event. Uh, to start out though, um, sadly, I have some bad news. Uh, Magnus, who was here to do the SQL covers uh, topic, is was unfortunately sick today. Um, so we will have no SQL uh, for this uh, session, but we will have no SQL. So that's my one dad joke I'm allowed to do every uh, workshop. So feel free. But you know, if you want to learn about, more about SQL, uh, we have good news for you. Um, <clears throat> coming uh, actually in two weeks' time, on Wednesday the 21st, we'll have a streaming event uh, with myself and uh, colleague Carlota talking about uh, getting started with uh, SQL and data visualization. So we'll walk you through both like building SQL queries uh, and actually a sample project. And then once you get the data, how do you do that? How do you build some visualizations that maybe you're solving something uh, for your project or business? Um, and if there's any thought that maybe I gave Magnus a virus or something so I could promote my own content, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> it just so happened that we we're also covering that uh, in, in two weeks. Uh, and also just to round out our kind of data, because I assume maybe you've come here because you love data or talking about databases. I do have also a session coming up on the 28th uh, called Working With Data for AI Projects. So we'll walk around, walk through kind of getting data, uh, cleaning data, exploring that data, and actually getting it prepared for building an AI model or an AI project. Uh, but you probably didn't come here to hear me talk about other talks. So we will hand it over to our first speak your email talking about MongoDB and the world of NoSQL. There we go. And hopefully you have my screen as well. Yeah, perfect. So welcome everyone to this, uh, this first talk. Uh, so we're going to start out with uh, NoSQL. Um, and it's going to be about getting started with uh, MongoDB. So my name is uh, Emil Nildersen. Uh, I work as a senior solution architect at MongoDB. Uh, and that means that I meet with a lot of customers and kind of engage with them in their journey of building their next product or their next use case. So I'm really kind of familiar with actually like meeting with a lot of customers in the beginning of their process and kind of helping them getting ready and supporting their new uh, uh, product or mission. MongoDB. So if you are not familiar with MongoDB, uh, MongoDB was founded in 2009. Uh, by two uh, gentlemen, uh, Elliot and Dwight. And MongoDB is the source available data product uh, built by MongoDB Inc. So it's an open source product backed by a company called MongoDB Inc. And MongoDB Atlas is actually our cloud native developer data platform in the cloud uh, that's built and operated by MongoDB um, together uh, with MongoDB, uh, the database at its core. See, I managed to pinch myself with the, the cable here. So at the center of MongoDB, we have something called the, data, uh, the document data model. Uh, and essentially, the document model is uh, the basis of the NoSQL part in MongoDB. And the great thing about uh, the document model is it naturally maps to objects. So when you're building your application, when you're building either if it's a mobile application, if it's a web application, you're quite used to working with objects. Even if you're working in like native C or if you're working in Java or JavaScript or Python or whatever type of programming language you're actually working in, you're usually working in objects. And data in MongoDB is actually represented as objects. And that's kind of the basis for the document model to allow you to actually represent the data in the database in the same format and style as you're actually viewing the data and representing the data in your application itself. So why is this really good for, for developers? Well, it kind of limits the taxation of having to switch context every time you're working with data in the database. So for example, if you're working with SQL, 
you will usually have some kind of object relation mapper or you have some mapping that you need to do between your objects in your code and the objects or the data in your database. So for example, we may, might have uh, uh, different types of tables in the relational world. Uh, and if we're gonna fetch all our user profile, we're gonna need to fetch that from different tables across the data set. And this means that we as a developer need to understand the data set more in, in general and the whole relational model of the database to be able to fetch the correct data for our application. And we try to mitigate that by actually storing the data in the database in the same way direction that you are actually accessing the data in your application. And from our perspective, documents are really universal. So within MongoDB, we have support for a, uh, a lot of different types of data structures within the document itself. So of course, JSON documents is maybe the first thing that comes to mind uh, when working with object-related data. But we can also support tabular data. We can also support key value pairs. Uh, that's really common today in the NoSQL world where you have a key, which could be, for example, your username. And then you have the value, which is your actual username. And that's kind of the way you store uh, data in a key value pair. We can store raw text. We can also store geospatial data. So if you have a geospatial use case, for example, storing location of a, a specific device or uh, storing locations of restaurants or, or apartments, MongoDB actually has the support to understand and allow you to query from a geographical perspective. For example, give me all of the data points within a certain range of a specific uh, location, or give me all of the data points within a, a certain um, sphere of influence or even a shape. So we can tell the MongoDB database to give us all of the documents that fits within a specific uh, shape. So this could be, for example, um, a, a country uh, on a map. Give us all the data points that fits within that country, for example. And we have support in the database to actually allow you to do those types of queries directly towards the database, instead of having to implement that on a application level instead. We can handle graph data. So we can actually have uh, uh, data that's hierarchical. Uh, and we can also do mapping with the, uh, between the different nodes in this hierarchy. Uh, so you can actually then understand the structure of your data and the relationships between uh, the points in that data as well. Time series is another great example where we actually excel today uh, with the new re newly releases in MongoDB. We have great support for time series data that allows you to actually uh, take time series data from your sensors and other types of uh, uh, environments, put it into MongoDB uh, in a very efficient way. And we also have a lot of built-in queries to allow you to actually support time series use cases as well. For example, doing window functions and those kind of uh, queries as well. But the great thing here is that we can actually have all of these types of different documents or data models within the same database, which makes it really easy to actually combine data together. So let's say, for example, we have a machine producing a lot of time series data. Uh, we can store that in MongoDB, but we can also store the general configuration of that machine or the digital twin of that machine in MongoDB as well. And then we can easily, within the same system, do cross-references between the different data sets. So that's also a strength of having one general database that allows you to do uh, a lot of different use cases within the same system. If you're coming from a relational world, uh, the document model may seem kind of uh, robust or maybe a bit fluent, uh, and you're not uh, kind of um, having a hard time mapping between the relational world where the relationship between different data points is really key. And you're also doing a lot of data normalization. So you would actually have to move a lot of data uh, around and not be uh, storing data uh, multiple times, for example. That's a really kind of regular use case for a relational world. You would have your users column and you would have your interests column, for example, and then you would have a mapping table between users and interests to map which users are actually interested in something else. In MongoDB, we instead do denormalization of data. So we're actually storing data that's uh, used or accessed together. We store that together in the database as well. So when you're actually going to fetch the user data, the interests of that specific user are actually stored together 
uh, with the user in the same document. And this has a lot of benefits when it comes to actually accessing the data. We only have one place to access the data. There's only one place where the database needs to uh, look for the data, which means that we're actually removing a lot of latency of having to fetch data from different tables, combining it together before returning it to the user. We can actually now allow the database engine to fetch the data from one place in memory or on disk, for example. So in the relational world, we would have a different set of tables, uh, all uh, doing joins between each other to actually get the same result uh, for, uh, for the user. And in the document model, we would store the data something like this. So we can see we have a, a name field uh, that's actually an object containing the first and last name of the user. We could have the address, which is an array. So the user could have multiple addresses, for example. Uh, we have a, a geolocation, we have a date of birth, and, and so on. So in MongoDB, we really kind of stress the thing that data that is accessed together should also be stored together. That's kind of the baseline when, when doing data modeling for, for MongoDB. So MongoDB is available in multiple ways of deployment. So we have something called MongoDB Enterprise Advanced that allows you to actually do self-managed on-premise uh, in your own data centers, on your own PC, on your own laptop. Uh, you can run it in the private cloud. You can run it in a hybrid environment on the public cloud in your own private data centers as well. Or you can run it uh, fully on the public cloud uh, using a database as a service that's called MongoDB Atlas. And also we have the community edition of MongoDB as well, which is fully open source, free to use for everyone uh, in any type of capacity. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about MongoDB Atlas uh, and also the possibilities you have with Atlas uh, and actually how easy it is to get started with MongoDB using MongoDB Atlas. So MongoDB Atlas builds on the core of MongoDB, which is the document model. So it's the core database. It's the same database engine. It's the same source code that runs in Community Edition that also powers MongoDB Atlas. So we got all of the features that we were talking about with graph data, geospatial, time series, and so on. All that's contained within the database itself. And then we add something called the unified interface. And that's actually allowing you to access data in a very simple way. So we're giving you a lot of tools to simplify how you actually access MongoDB and remove a lot of um, development time and effort from your side to actually get your database up and running and get your applications connected. We then add a lot of additional enterprise security features. Uh, we have the multi-cloud and distributed uh, databases that allows you to deploy databases, databases across the globe from one single control plane on all of the uh, public clouds. And then we add a lot of different other features to, uh, to the stack as well. So today, we're going to run a very quick demo. And we're going to take a look at the document model itself. We're going to take a look at search, how we can quickly implement that. And we're going to take a look how we can get a, a front end connected as well. So to use MongoDB, uh, we have different ways of accessing the database, the database itself. So on the top layer here, we can see the different ways we can actually engage with the database. So we have the native drivers uh, that we support essentially all of the big programming languages. We have a native driver that's language agnostic, which means that when you're working in Python, it's actually you're talking Python to the driver. When you're working in JavaScript, you're talking JavaScript to the driver. When you're working in Java, you're talking Java to the driver. So it's language specific, which allows you to actually have the same context when developing for MongoDB. Then we have the data API and app services. And that's really a pre-built, pre-hosted, and pre-managed backend for your database hosted by MongoDB in Atlas. And that's what we're going to use today to actually kind of spring boot our web application and get up and running really, really quickly. Then we have mobile. Uh, so in 2019, MongoDB acquired a company called Realm. And Realm is this great open source mobile database that powers a lot of applications today where you actually need to have local database on the device. So what we added in 2019 when we ac acquired Realm was something called Realm Sync. And that's now today called Device Sync. And that allows you to actually do all of the syncing of the offline data in your mobile device with the cloud without having to develop and maintain your own uh, code for that. So we will actually help you with all the syncing and persistence of managing a local database 
on your mobile device synced with Atlas. And then we have charts, which is a built-in feature that allows you to do data visualization and embedding those in your applications as well. To query MongoDB, you can use MongoDB query language, MQL. And then we also have a SQL query engine. So you can actually talk SQL to MongoDB directly if you prefer. And you can also do data federation to actually uh, pull in different data sources into the MongoDB engine and use MQL to query both SQL, uh, S3 buckets, and also other MongoDB clusters from one single connection string. And then we can store the data in a multitude of ways, and we can also host the data in multitudes of ways, uh, in multitude of clouds. So now, enough of uh, PowerPoints. Let's do some actual uh, demo. So what we're going to build. So we're going to build a simple application to do Pokemon searching. Uh, so I guess uh, a lot of people actually jumped on the train with uh, being able to catch all of the Pokemons out in the wild. And maybe you're interested to find out what kind of, which kind of Pokemons there is. So I created a small application with a search field that allows me to actually search for Pokemons. So the stack for this application is the front end is built in React, and it's going to run on my machine. And the back end is going to be hosted on MongoDB Atlas. And we're going to uh, use the core database. And we're also going to use Atlas Search to actually facilitate the searching of um, our Pokemons. So let's see if we can actually get this uh, up and running. So today, we have the uh, front end running, the Pokemon Search application. And if I try to search for something here, let's see. Charmander. OK, we didn't really get any results. And it's uh, kind of struggling to actually find something. So let's take a look at our source code. OK, so we have some function called handle search. I guess that's the one that's going to handle our search input. And OK, it looks like we need to actually have a backend for this application to work. So we need to actually fetch some kind of backend URL to get our application to work. OK, so let's fix that. So we're going to head into MongoDB Atlas. So Atlas is the cloud control plane to actually allow us to run a MongoDB as a service. So we're going to start by creating a database. We're going to head to the shared free tier. Of course, we're going to host it on Azure. And we're going to put it in the Netherlands. And that's pretty much it. That's uh, all the, the hard uh, decisions we need to make. So we're going to create the cluster. And I'm actually uh, uh, already prepared a username, uh, the MongoDB admin. And I'm just going to uh, edit the password to make sure that we actually are in, uh, uh, or what we can actually do if we're going to set uh, my secret. Just going to update the password. And we're pretty much uh, set. So what is actually happening now is that our cluster is going to be provisioned on Azure. Uh, in this case, it's going to be in the Netherlands. And it's actually uh, up and running right now. So it just takes one minute or two to actually get the cluster up and running. So this is now a fully empty MongoDB cluster ready to be used by our application. And we're going to do a last step. So the databases in MongoDB is secure by default, which means that you can, you can actually not access the clusters until you open up access to them. So it's not going to be the case of you're putting something up, and somebody directly jumps up uh, onto it and kind of hijacks your data. So it's secure by default. So we're going to add the data, uh, our IP address to actually allow access. So this is uh, the current IP address. And there we go. So what we're going to do now is we're going to preload some data into this cluster. So we need to add our Pokemons, essentially, to this cluster. So I'm going to hit Connect. We're going to go with MongoDB Compass, which is our uh, desktop client. I'm going to copy the connection string. I'm going to open up Compass. We're going to paste our connection string. We're going to have our username, which was Mongo Admin. Yeah. OK, uh, we'll do that after we've done this. So my 
secret. Let's see if we can actually do some zooming in. That big enough? Yeah. We're gonna create a new database. We're gonna call it Pokemon, and we're gonna create a new collection. A collection in MongoDB is essentially a table uh, from a relational perspective, and we're gonna call that one Pokemon's. We're gonna create a database. We're gonna see if we can actually find it. Here we go, Pokemon, Pokemon's, and then we're gonna add some data. So we're gonna actually import some data. I have already preloaded or pre-cooked some, some data uh, containing uh, Pokemons. But I also included in the source code, which I'm going to share afterwards, there's a script to actually fetch all of this data from an open API uh, online. So uh, you can actually get the data as well. So we're going to import uh, this data. It's roughly, yeah, it's exactly uh, 1,048 different uh, Pokemons. So now we have all of the Pokemons loaded into our cluster. So we're going to head back to the Atlas console. And then we're going to browse the collections in Atlas as well to make sure that the, the data is actually there. So Pokemons, yeah, all of the data is here. Perfect. So now we're going to build our backend. And for the backend, we're going to use uh, MongoDB Atlas App Services, which is the pre-managed, uh, pre-hosted uh, data, uh, database backend for, for MongoDB. So we're going to head to App Services. And we're going to build our own application. So there's a lot of guides and stuff like that to help you on your way. Uh, so we're going to link our uh, data source, which is our cluster that we created. We're going to name this application just application zero. We're going to host it in the Netherlands in Azure. So we're going to create our app service. It's going to take a second. And then we can close the guides. So we're going to use something called HTTPS endpoints. So this is going to allow us to create a API endpoint for our uh, web application, for our front end, essentially, to call. So I'm going to call this route uh, slash search, because it's going to handle all of the search requests for our front end. It's going to be enabled. Uh, it's going to be a simple get request. And we're going to do uh, some respond with results. So we would like to send some results back to the user. And we're going to select a function. So the function is what's going to run when somebody hits this HTTPS endpoint. So we click on a function, and we're going to create a new function. The function is going to be called search. And here are some kind of boilerplate code if you're getting started with uh, Atlas uh, and App Services to kind of get you started. It's well commented and, and stuff like that. Of course, I have pre-cooked some, uh, some functions as well. So we have a function pre-cooked here. So I'm going to copy that one, and I'm going to replace. Uh, that was not the way to do that. That's the way to copy. We're going to replace uh, the built-in function with our own function. It's essentially really uh, easy. So what we're doing is that we're going to call this function every time, and then uh, we're going to uh, run something called an aggregation towards our database. And this is going to be run by the function itself every time somebody hits our HTTPS endpoints. So we're going to save this one. Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the functions built uh, for app services are built in JavaScript. That's correct. It's only JavaScript for now. Uh, um, so we got our function, and we got our endpoint enabled. And the final thing we're going to do is head to functions. And we're going to click on our function. We're going to go to settings. And I'm going to allow this function to run as system. So this is also a security feature that you can uh, encompass. So you can actually use a JWT token from the authenticated user in your front application to actually run those uh, the function as that user, if you'd like with all of the permissions that user has on the data, for example. But for, for ease of demo, we're just going to use the system one. We're going to save the draft. And finally, we're ready to deploy this function and the HTTPS endpoint. 
So this allows us to review all of the changes that we're doing to our backend. And this can also be connected directly to source uh, control. So you can connect app services directly to GitHub, GitLab, for example, and do all of your programming uh, locally, and then sync uh, your source to your source repo, and then allow Atlas to actually fetch uh, the code from, from that space as well. So now we're going to hit deploy. So now our search endpoint is up and running. And the final step is to actually enable search. So to enable search, we're going to go back to our data. I'm going to browse the collection. We're going to go to our Pokemon's collection. And we're going to click on search indexes. So Atlas Search is a Lucene-based search engine. So it's the same search engine that powers Elasticsearch, Solar, and so on. But it kind of removes all of the hassles of having a separate environment for Elasticsearch or for any type of text-based search. And it actually allows us to deploy that in conjunction with the database. So we're going to manage this uh, search infrastructure for you and allow you to actually search on your data that's in MongoDB with any, uh, without any additional uh, workload on your uh, um, management team. So we're going to create a search index. You can do it a visual editor. Then you get a lot of options to uh, switch and choose on how you would like to create your search index. We're going to do it today with a JSON editor because I have already pre-cooked a uh, search index. And again, all of the pre-cooked uh, data and so on is in the GitHub repo that I'm going to share with you guys afterwards as well. Uh, so you can try this out yourself. So we're going to call this one autocomplete. And we're going to paste in our search index. I'm going to say next. And we're going to create the search index. So what happens now is that Atlas is spinning up a Atlas search instance for you. And it's going to start indexing your data in uh, towards that search uh, engine. So we will see in a few seconds, actually, uh, this one turning in saying uh, done. And whilst it's doing that, we're actually going to head to App Services, and we're going to fetch the URL uh, for our backend service. I forgot to do that earlier. So we're going into our application. We go into our endpoints. We're going to take a look at our endpoints. And we got the URL that we need for our front end. We're going to copy that. I'm going to head into my source code on the app.js. And here we have a nice tag that we need to replace with our backend URL. So we're going to replace that one, save. We're then going to head back to Atlas and take a, a look at our search index to make sure that it's actually completed. Atlas search. And we're going to see if we can get it to uh, actually be ready. Hopefully, the demo god, gods are with us, and we should be uh, uh, done in a uh, second. Yep. So now we're actually done. We can see that uh, the search index has indexed 100% uh, of all of our data in that cluster. So now, if we head back to the Pokemon search engine, we uh, should refresh this page. And then if we now type Pika, uh, for example, and then we got a lot of uh, Pikachus uh, actually in our search engine. So we can search for Charmander, and we got a couple of Charmanders as well. So now essentially we've gone from not having a backend at all to having a fully working and fully enabled uh, searching backend for our database. So that's kind of me showing how easy it is to get started with uh, MongoDB and also MongoDB Atlas uh, together with the whole back end of Atlas App Services and also powered by Atlas Search to actually enable you to do quick searching on your data. And this is without having to copy your data to a separate search engine uh, and index the data in that engine. So for example, if I keep on adding data, that's going to be indexed directly by Atlas Search, and we can start searching on the data directly. So if we go back to our slideshow here, code and documentation, uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, I'm going to share this one as well afterwards. Uh, but I don't know, you're on the stream, maybe take a screenshot or something uh, so you have it. Uh, and the guys in the room, uh, we're going to share this one afterwards as well. Before we head into Q&A, uh, I also would like to share that there's going to be a MongoDB Atlas 101 e-workshop 
uh, free of charge for anyone to sign up to. Uh, so I would recommend if you're interested in MongoDB Atlas and what you can actually do with MongoDB, uh, take a seat at this uh, workshop uh, and uh, uh, get started on your, your next, next project uh, together with MongoDB. So do we have any questions from, uh, from the stream? We, yeah, we do. I um, distracted the chat on uh, Pokemon uh, chat, so we know a lot about everyone's favorite Pokemon. <laughs> okay. But there was a great question. Um, so I use a SQL database to build IoT apps uh, due to the team's expertise. Uh, they create some indicators, which are relationships of raw data from the different sensors, I'm assuming in the IoT devices. Uh, how could it be possible with a NoSQL database? Yeah, so with MongoDB, we have native support for time series data, uh, which means that the database engine itself uh, has an understanding of time series data. So in that case, what we're going to use as a kind of index key is, of course, time. So time is of the essence when you're working with time series data. And then we're going to have something called a meta field. And the meta field dictates uh, what kind of device it is that, sends, that are sending this data. So if we have a machine 001, that would be meta, and the time uh, would be yeah the time that the event happened. And then you can add how many other types of metrics that you're actually logging for that device at that specific time. And then the database engine itself actually understands how to store this data in a very, very efficient way within MongoDB. So we can reach a huge amount of compression uh, levels when it comes to actually storing time series data within MongoDB. Uh, so I will definitely definitely take a look at the capabilities of time series together with MongoDB for IoT use cases. Does anyone have any questions here in the audience? None. Oh, yeah, one. Yep. Some of our, our customers demands that every data that we work with is stored in a Swedish uh, in a Swedish um, uh, storage, you could say. How we would use this service uh, for Atlas? Yep. Um, what I can see is like, of course, you can initiate the database through uh, another host, but in the end, it's somehow stored in the Atlas, right? As well. Yeah. How we would make sure that our Swedish clients that demand the data to be totally governed and stored in a in a Swedish facility. Yeah. So with MongoDB Atlas, for example, uh, we have 95 plus regions today. Uh, the subsets of regions you saw me use today is only for the uh, free tier, which is free of charge. But if you have a dedicated cluster, you can actually deploy it in all of the data centers in Sweden. Uh, for Azure, for example, we have Staffan Storp and, uh, and also it's, what's the other one, Gävle? Uh, yeah, exactly. So MongoDB is available in those regions as well, managed by Atlas. Uh, so you can actually host MongoDB in Atlas in those uh, Swedish data centers as well. Uh, so that's one point. Uh, if the customer is against using cloud, uh, then we have MongoDB Enterprise Advanced, which is the on-premise uh, way of uh, deploying MongoDB. And we have something called Ops Manager, uh, which looks and feels like MongoDB Atlas, but it's fully self-managed and self-hosted. Uh, but you get a lot of the benefits that you get with Atlas, uh, with Ops Manager as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, when choosing between the different kind of databases like SQL and NoSQL, uh, if you have a new project and you want to architect and choose the suitable um, like uh, database uh, schema for them, uh, especially at the beginning of the project, the, the requirement like mainly the requirements are not clear and some queries are easier in NoSQL, some queries are easier in SQL. So how to think in this situation, starting a new project with um, like each kind of um, data business? Yeah, sure. So with MongoDB, we really have kind of a, a code first approach. Uh, so when you're working with SQL, you usually have a database first approach. So you need to define your tables and you need to define your schema ahead of actually started to build your application. Because making changes to the uh, collect to the tables and stuff like that in a relational world usually means dropping the table and recreating it from scratch. Uh, or having to reiterate over all of the data to add those missing fields and those missing data points. 
In MongoDB with the flexible, flexible data model, you can actually just start adding fields to your collection, remove fields from your collection. You can even have documents that have different set of fields within the same collection. So for MongoDB, we really have kind of a code first perspective. So you would start building your code and you would see what kind of storage requirements you would have in your database for that. If you then have certain use cases for SQL, we have the SQL interface towards MongoDB as well. So let's say, for example, you're using uh, Power BI uh, to be Microsoft-centric here. So you're using Power BI to actually do some data analytics on the data stored. Uh, in MongoDB, you can actually use our SQL interface and connect uh, Power BI directly to MongoDB. So you can actually run SQL queries uh, towards MongoDB. And a lot of people think like no SQL means no relationships, but that's not really true. We have uh, joins in MongoDB as well, and we call them lookups instead. So you can actually have data uh, normalized across uh, MongoDB as well, because it doesn't always make sense to store all of the data together. So we have one uh, in our example data set that is uh, a sample set of movies. Uh, it's called like Mflix or something like that. So all of the movies can have comments to them. And we allow users to add comments to those uh, movies. And there's actually no way of telling how many comments there are going to be uh, for a specific movie. So it wouldn't make sense to actually store the comments together in the same document as the rest of the movie information. Because there is actually a limit to how big a document can be. And we wouldn't like to transfer like 16 megabytes every time we would like to fetch uh, the movie, for example. So in that case, we would store all of the comments in their own collection. And then we would do a lookup from the movie's collection towards the comments to fetch 10 comments or fetch all of the comments for a specific movie, for example. So there are ways of actually doing relationships and doing a, a lookup or joins in MongoDB as well. Yeah, there's quite a lot of questions now after the <laughs> stream as well. Um, the first one is, I think you might have covered some of this, but how does relational mapping in NoSQL work? Yeah, and in, in our case, uh, we have different strategies for doing relationships. Uh, we have something called nesting or embedding, which essentially means that you would take your data and put it into an array within the document itself. So instead of referencing an external document or an external collection, you would take uh, that data and put it into an array within that same document. So uh, in the example I showed earlier, we have the addresses of a user, for example. They can have multiple addresses, and then we can store that in an array. Uh, inside of the document, and we call that embedding. And then we also have uh, what we, I just uh, explained with lookups, where you can actually then do joins between different collections in MongoDB as well. Cool. Uh, which first steps do you recommend for migrating an app uh, using SQL to NoSQL? And this is the same person asked about the IoT, so they're okay. They're ready to go now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, MongoDB has a lot of tooling for going from SQL to NoSQL. Uh, so reach out uh, to uh, the closest MongoDB representative, and we have a lot of tooling, both from a professional services perspective to help you with that, but also uh, toolings you can uh, run and manage your, uh, on your own to actually do the whole relational mapping of the relational uh, database today and how to map that towards MongoDB in a really easy way. Um, so we can help with, uh, with migration. Uh, in other words, with data all being in the same place, so I guess to your point about putting the data where it needs to be, uh, isn't there a lot of duplicate data? Uh, sure, it could be. Uh, so storing all of the same interests uh, in all of the users instead of having a interests collection, for example, would mean that we will be storing like gamer or football or something like that uh, for all of the users that are interested with that. But really, like storage today, is not going to be the most expensive part of your application, probably. Uh, in the 60s, when relational uh, databases were developed, storage was immensely expensive. And that's why you would like do everything you can to not duplicate data. But we don't really have that problem today. And essentially, with the compression we have in MongoDB, uh, it's not going to be a huge issue when it comes to duplicating data in that way. And the last one we'll do, um, how is the flexibility of the model uh, affect the query performance of MongoDB? Uh, so with the flexibility in the document, uh, in the document model, uh, I would say from a query performance perspective, uh, I, I can't really see how that would impact uh, 
we we have functions within MongoDB that allows you to do, for example, um, projections, which means that we all, you would only fetch the fields of a document that you're actually interested in. So if you have a huge document, you can actually strip down and only fetch the data you're interested in. Uh, and also, we're working with uh, indexes. So you can actually index multiple fields. You can have compound indexes uh, that would support your queries. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of ways of actually uh, having great uh, query performance when it comes to, to the document model. And also, storing the data together means that it's going to be much less latency of actually fetching the data from one point uh, in the file system than to actually have to do joins across multiple tables that could actually be stored on different hard drives in the, in the backend. So I lied. This is the last question now, the real last question. Um, with the SQL database, normalization and denormalization is an important part of the design process. Uh, how or what would you optimize NoSQL design, or how do you optimize design? Yeah, I will, I will go back to what I said earlier, like that, that MongoDB is really a kind of a code-first approach. So you would start building your application, and your data model will usually derive from the, the needs of the application. So again, think about how you're actually consuming the data when you're actually then uh, mapping out the data and building the data model. And we do have a lot of uh, patterns for different types of data that you can actually look in the MongoDB documentation. So if you're storing product data in a product catalog, for example, uh, we have a pattern for how you should structure the, your data in that case to actually be really, really performant, for example. Cool, thanks. Cool, thank you. Cool. While they set up, um, so I guess you know, if you were to consider databases being a family and uh, SQL being the older, mature uh, sibling, and then NoSQL being the middle child, I think if, no offense, but graph databases is probably the crazy younger sibling uh, of the graph, uh, the database world. So I'm super interested to learn. Uh, and we have an expert here, Max, uh, working for Neo4j, uh, that they build graph databases, and he'll tell you the crazy world of the graph databases and what we can do with them. Probably because I don't think it's on. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, perfect. Let's see if we uh, get something on screen as well. All right. Uh, I just want to probe the room here uh, first and ask how many of you guys have heard about graph databases before, uh, specifically in Neo4j? All right. Uh, have you tried it out or used it in some of your use cases or uh, just heard the name? All right. Um, so as we start, uh, I want to start by sharing one of uh, the grievances that I have. In my free time, I, uh, I like to travel, I like to do stuff when I'm not in front of the computer, I like skiing, I like meeting new people, and all of that stuff. But one of the things that I come across is that um, it doesn't matter how long you've known a person, they usually ask, what do you do? What's your job, right? And I tell them, are you sure you want to know? It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a di in digital marketing or whatever, and I tell them, all right, I'll tell you, I'm a developer advocate slash DevOps engineer for Neo4j's developer relations team, which is a graph database, right? And then they usually go, what? Developer what? DevOps what? <laughs> and so the way I try to describe it is like developer advocacy. It's like PR for, uh, uh, for developers, right? But uh, uh, this one guy, he... Uh, he looked a little bit too excited. He was like, oh, I know what PR is. PR is amazing, right? And I tell him, like, yeah, yeah, it's like PR, but without all the fancy parties. And then he goes like, all right. And, um, and then this DevOps thing, right? Um, so in the developer relations team, I manage some of our, uh, some of our products and services, uh, which is one of them is Sandbox. Uh, which gives you a graph database that you can try out for a couple of days, uh, play with it, and uh, throw it away. It has a specific focus on uh, graph data science, 
and uh, also manage the infrastructure for uh, one of our learning platforms, which is graphacademy.com, uh, where you can do courses, get certified, and learn more about this whole graph data, data science and, and our query language and all of that stuff as well. And um, usually, people who haven't heard about Neo4j, usually it's someone in the business that has heard about it. But, you know, so usually I get the questions of, who even uses this? We use SQL for everything or, or something like that. And I'm like, all right, yeah, there are people using this. It's about 75% of Fortune 100 that uses our database in some capacity or another, right? But the reason you might not have heard of it is that uh, is that, that we've mainly been focusing on enterprise customers for now. And uh, that is changing. That is something that we are... Uh, that we're not moving from it, but we <laughs> are also opening up our SaaS services uh, with something we call AuraDB Free or AuraDB, uh, which has a free option as well, which is uh, not limited to three days or anything like that. It's free forever. It has a limit on how many nodes and relationships and things like that you can have in your database, but uh, you can easily get started and uh, doing your own uh, applications and running it in a uh, in a production environment, right? Uh, so all you got to do is sign up, uh, click on that button that says create a database, uh, press in the free option. There are some starting data sets if you want to try it out and just you know dabble with it and uh, get get some credentials and you're off to the races. You can start plugging in your, your drivers or whatever else service that you want to play with it. Um, all right, and um, when, you, um, uh, when you're up and running, um, you might ask yourself, like the question I usually get when I talk about this is like, all right, so graph database, what, that, that, what does that mean? Do you like make pretty graphs in your in your database? And I, I say to them, no, 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 no. Well, graphs are beautiful, but you know, a graph is not a chart. So in our space, we usually differentiate very, very strictly about uh, what is a graph and what is a chart. Sure, you can make a chart from all your graph data and stuff like that, but but graphs are can look like this, right? They can be very, very complex, and they can. Um, they might scare you at first sight, right? Uh, but that is the beauty of graph databases. It makes it much easier to work with complex data. Um, one of the sayings we have is that graphs are everywhere. Uh, and graph, so what is a graph, right? Uh, graph started with this guy called Leonard Euler. Or there was this other guy that, that had this problem uh, uh, that's called the Seven Bridges of Kron uh, Kroningsberg. Kroningsberg does not exist anymore, but there used to be seven bridges between these land masses, right? And he, he realized that it's impossible to actually walk uh, over all these bridges without crossing the same land mass twice. And Euler got this problem, and that's the start of what he called graph theory, right? And so basically, if you want to be really simple about what a graph is, a graph is just, you know, it's a set of objects that is some way connected, right? That's the simplest way we can represent things like that. And what we call these objects in a graph database is nodes. And what we call these connections are relationships. It doesn't have to be simpler than that. You might come across some mathematicians or whatever that want to call them vertices or edges or, or, or you know, the, that's the formal uh, thing about, about, about graphs, right? But these are relationships, they usually have a direction, they have a type. And um, uh, so, for example, we have Max, that's me. I have a bank account and I own that bank account. So that would be really simple to just represent uh, me as one node and the bank account as another and then a relationship to tell you that, all right, uh, Max owns this bank account. doesn't have to be more complicated than that, right? But in a graph database, we need some way to kind of uh, enrich our data, right? We need to be able to tell you about our entities and our nodes and uh, what they actually represent. So that, then we have something called a property graph. 
And a proper graph, put very simply, is a set of objects with properties and labels. And um, labels is a special type of property. Um, some might scold me for calling it that, but so basically, a property is something that's attached to an object or a node. And uh, that might be an email address, or it might be an ID uh, of, of that node, or so on and so forth. You can put whatever you want uh, on there. Uh, the same goes for relationships. I haven't put it on this, uh, on this uh, graph here, but, but you could put uh, a property on a relationship as well. So, for example, you might be owns, and then you might have, like, sends 2008 or whatever, right? And uh, uh, so we call these properties properties. That's pretty simple. We use them to enrich uh, nodes or, or relationships to kind of describe our domain, right? And labels, simply called labels. And labels gives us kind of the, the role uh, of a node. So that would be person, account, car, whatever you want to call it, right? But they're also optional. You don't really need a label to actually put a node in the database. It's going to hurt you <laughs> when you try to, to, to access that data, but it's uh, definitely par possible. And you can have more than one. So, for example, you could have a person. You can have a, a, a person could also be an officer and so on and so forth. Uh, or it could be, um, uh, you could annotate it with that this has some kind of data and so on and so forth. Um, so if we put all of this together, uh, this is how uh, a very simple uh, model might look like. You have a person, uh, and you have two persons, one named Dan, one, one named Anne, and you see that Dan loves Anne, and Anne loves her back. But uh, notice the directions of these, right? So we have, instead of, <coughs> they're not um, unidirectional, right? Uh, so for example, uh, in this instance, we would see that uh, Dan lives with Dan, but not the other way around. That would tell us that, all right, it might be Anne's apartment, right? Uh, but how that is interpreted would depend on your domain model, right? But you would see that they both drive uh, that car, uh, no, uh, Dan drives that car, but, but Alan owns it, right? And you might have a, a little bit of a property there as well. Um, so, uh, so what you might say, all right? Uh, I can easily do this with a SQL or a document model or anything like that, right? Uh, and yes, you could, yes, you could, and uh, it's usually about semantics right you can you can take your you can take your data and you can put it in whatever format that you want right you can make it tabular you can make it json you can make it either way you want that's not the issue um, so let's say we have tables right we might have this employee table we have this department table and to be able to see which employees are, are connected to some kind of department you would have to, in runtime, do a bunch of joins, right? Or a lookup table or whatever you want to do, right? Uh, so for example, uh, you have to create this, this intermediate table that, that holds these kind of, this information about the relationship, right? And you might see that, that all right, so Alice has these connections and then you join. And all of this has to be done in runtime, right? You have to compute this every time that, that, that you're trying to access it. And that might cause a problem, maybe not in this case, because this case is really simple, right? But, so you get the data out, and then what? Well, in a graph database, we store these uh, relationships. Uh, and we store them so that we don't have to guess. We don't have to search for where that uh, other object is. Right, so if you look at an ID of a node, for example, that is literally the offset in the in the storage file. So we know that all right, we have to go to exactly this spot to find whatever corresponds to the other side of this relationship, right? Uh, so that's something that we call index-free adjacency, right? And that allows us to do a lot of more performant traversal within the database. So you can ask things like. 
who belongs to this uh, this department or which people are belong to the apartment that went to this school that went to this thing and this thing and this thing you don't really have to specify exactly um the way you achieve it but you can explore the relationships in between right so one of the things that we get with this index free adjacency is that we get this scalable graph algorithms so we can do shortest path things we can do centrality metrics we can do a lot of interesting uh things to find out things about the relationships between our data points so for example if document and sql are very good at retrieving uh, uh data entities right and uh, unfortunately we call <laughs> sql for relational uh, relational databases while we're much better at actually getting data about the relationships between uh the actual data right so when data becomes complex you might be more interested in how does this relate to other things instead of just getting that data back and uh we also have um which is very popular in the no sql uh, uh space uh schema optional so you don't really have to specify a rigid schema before you can put in constraints to actually enforce the schema but you don't have to it will take whatever you throw at it basically um also agility when it comes to development and things like that the node data mo- the graph data model is very like uh whiteboard modeling when you put uh, usually when you put things on the on the on the whiteboard it might look like here's max he bought this thing he has this account number and you can basically take that whiteboard model throw it into the database and start querying it right uh, but also we have a lot of tools we have uh, a whole new field that called that's called graph data science uh where we can do things like uh prediction vectors and stuff like that and centrality metrics and and um well that could be a whole other talk or uh course uh maybe so i won't be talking too much about uh, graph data science today i do got a slide to show you guys but uh we also have a big developer community and a lot of ecosystem products right so you have your etl that you can load in a lot of data um graphql is one of those things that's built around graph so it um so it couples itself very well with a with with a graph database as well. So we built out this library so that application developers can start uh using it with a lot uh, uh very frictionless and get from zero to an application very fast. Uh we also have arrows which is uh, our modeling tool uh near semantics for those of you that heard of the semantic web and, and things like that uh helps you to work with uh with rdf data and turtle and all of those things um also in the o4j uh apoc is um a lot of a plugin that allows you to do a lot of uh different kinds of tasks we have connectors to a lot of the bi stuff you can throw sql at the database if you want to um uh but it only has like the read uh capabilities you won't be able to uh, to write through those connectors but also all the all of these like docker files and helm charts and all of that can get you started uh if you want to try that out on your own as well so gra- graph data science right uh which is basically um you have the graph algorithms you have a way of visualizing it makes it really simple to do that and also the type of graph queries that allow you to do uh, an in memory graph and kind of query that with very high performance so you can do things like a recommendation engines and stuff like that that's all pulled into memory and you can actually uh, traverse through the relationships of things uh very fast to find the kind of analysis that you that you want um all right so to use this database right we uh we have our own query language that might scare a couple of people um uh, <laughs> but you know so if we look at cipher right if you ever used sql or something like that it's going to be 
quite familiar with a little bit of a twist, right? So we use pattern matching instead for our query language. And that makes it much easier to kind of describe what you want to get back from the database. So instead of defining exactly what you're trying to achieve, you decide the pattern that you want to extract from the database. Uh, so the, the query language is uh, declarative, it's expressive, and it uses pattern matching, right? And it uses ASCII art. So basically, that, that's, <laughs> that's the, whole, the whole concept here, that we can express our patterns in ASCII art without using complex, uh, complex um, uh, vocabularies for, for things like that. So if we just look at uh, Dan, and we want to ask who he loves, right? So we might have something like match, which is kind of like um, from clause in, in SQL, but it uses pattern matching to derive what, what you want to derive the data from. So you're just going to tell it that we're looking for something labeled person that has the property name Dan, right? And it has the relationship to something it loves, right? And then you re return that, that value. So the return would be the select statement in SQL, for example. And that allows you to kind of, you know, just make these dash, uh, dashes and stuff like that to actually um, express very user-friendly how you want to access that data from your graph. Um, there's also a reference card online if you want to get started with Cypher. Uh, which has all of the clauses and stuff like that that you need to know, and a couple of examples of how to actually start working with it. So you might ask yourself, all right, so what is a good scenario to actually use a graph? Well, graphs are really good at exploring connections or relationships uh, and kind of under getting the understanding with relationships in between data points. It might be on par with all of these other uh, databases on retrieving uh, data points, but when you're trying to get an understanding of the relationships and how it relates to each other, we would, uh, that, that's one of our strong points, right? So for example, uh, one scenario would be, um, uh, as I just said, understanding the relationships between entities. So here, for example, you would have a customer that buys a product that's part of uh, a category, right? A customer buys a product that's part of another category. It's very easy to follow, right? And so this uh, might be used for something like a recommendation engine to on the fly trying to find and recommend products to customers that are out there, right? Or you might have fraud detection if you need to very quickly determine was this transaction fraudulent or not. For example, uh, you would look up a customer and you would be able to follow all of his transactions and see that, all right, this guy is not in Greece. So why would the transaction be there? That is one of our strongest use cases for, uh, for fraud detection. And um, also finding duplicates, digital twins and stuff like that. Uh, there are use cases within data lineage and, and, and social networks, but I won't go in much further on that. Uh, another one might be uh, when the problem involves a lot of self-referencing to the same type, right? Uh, so you might have an employee that manages another employee, you know, the, the typical hierarchy uh, structure, right? And so it's also used for things like uh, organizational hierarchies, access management, social influencers, if you've got like friend of a friend uh, kind of queries that you want to ask your database, right? Um, and if you try to explore relationship with different uh, varying depths, so let's say that you have, um, you have two different accounts, right? But uh, you're looking into uh, has any of the money through transaction ended up in this other account. It might be through, you know, shuffling transactions around, it might not be pre precise uh, numbers, but you can actually see that uh, has there been a path 
from one account to another. And that can be used for things like fraud rings and stuff like that, right? So a model that might look like this, where we have an organization that sells a product, another organization that sells a product, and, um, and uh, you can kind of identify these uh, things. And other, other things might be things like supply, uh, supply chain visibility, where you would have a supply chain and you would try to um, kind of dig down into where is this thing actually uh, making uh, problems in your in your pipeline, right? Um, it's also used in cases where you have like bill of materials or things like that. Instead of having huge tables of all of the materials and stuff like that, you can easily traverse and, and see exactly what is needed to build one of these products, for example. There's also network management and, 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 and routing and things like that as well. Um, all right, so um, another thing might be uh, if your problem involves discovering a lot of different paths and routes. Uh, it sounds a little bit similar, but um, here we can actually extract the route that we're traversing as we ask the database something. So we can ask, for example, um, I, uh, from this account, has anything uh, ended up in this account? But then we can also get the actual path that it has traveled, right? So you can see that, all right, it might not have been this amount of money, but it actually ended up there somehow, right? And you can expand and you can contract on these nodes as well, visually, to get a sense of what's going on there. Um, one example, a real world example, is ICIJ and the Panama Papers. Have anybody heard of the Panama Papers? All right. So this is one of the projects that we do in a program that we call Graphs for Good. Uh, it's basically we're allowing them to use our enterprise license to, uh, to find fraudulent behavior in offshore accounts, basically. So what they did is they got a leak, much like WikiLeaks, right? But they were all like documents scattered all over the place. And they were shell companies, they were officers that were under fake names and stuff like that. So this is the actual model that they use. And in Sandbox that I, that I described earlier, you can try out this data set as well and do your querying in there. Uh, so you have officers, you have intermediaries, you have addresses and entities. Because sometimes the uh, the offshore companies might just be, you know, on the same address, and you might not know who that person actually is. And sometimes the intermediary doesn't even know they're owning a company because of um, ID fraud and stuff like that. But this is what um, a company called Linkers or something like that used. Um, or built around Neo4j to be able to do this type of analysis, uh, which uh, has had a huge impact on. Uh, there are multiple data sets like this. So they've done the offshore and the uh, paradise papers as well as other leaks have been coming in. All right. So uh, as I told you about before, Cypher is the query language that we use. And as I told you, you don't really need to put labels and stuff like that on your, on your nodes. So one of the most simple queries you could do would be this query, where you just match N and return it. That would, that would fetch all of, the, all of the nodes that you have in your database, right? Uh, if you want to specif specify that to nodes that only has the person label, you would add a colon, and then you would just get the person uh, from that, or you would get just the person that has the name Tom Hanks, and that would uh, that would work. Uh, but in this syntax, you would only get like the exact match, right? So you might want to use uh, like a predicate instead, and you can still do that. You can still put a where clause there, make your predicates like you would uh, anywhere else, and um, you will be able to find it. And you could put, like, for example, where a movie is released between different years and stuff like that. It's much like SQL, 
but in a different order. It's more structured towards the way that you might think about the problem. Here are the nodes that we want to examine, filter out those nodes, and return the result, right? Um, all right, so if we don't know how things are connected, right? That might be one of the, 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 uh, the things that we want to explore when we're exploring our data. We can just put out a search. How is Tom Hanks connected anyway to a movie, right? And return the title of that. So in this case, you just put two dashes. And it doesn't matter if he's directed the movie, acted in the movie, or so on and so forth. You will still get back the results. And... <clears throat> So if we want to find all the movies that he is directed in and then order it by, by the latest movie, we can do something like this. Just specify which relationship you're looking for as the, these are labeled as well. And you get, you get that result back and then you put an order by like you would SQL. Pretty simple. Um, all right. And a query like this you will be able to find all the co-actors that Tom Hanks has worked with, right? Just put in that double dash. And notice that, that these arrows here, they actually have significance, right? That limits it to a direction. So when you put the, uh, when you put the relationships into the database, you will only be able to put it in one direction. But you can put it in the other direction as well. But if you query it without these uh, graded than or arrows or whatever you want to call it, uh, it will look at things both ways, right? But you can also then specify the exact kind of direction that you want to go with this query. And merge is another of those things that makes it easier to work with. Uh, so if we find a person uh, that has the name Tom Hanks, uh, we can put other properties to that node, right? So we match whatever we want to do. And um, uh, and we, if it doesn't exist, we will create it, right? There is also a create clause that will uh, that will fail if it finds something that's already there. But this assures that we uh, always uh, have the data that we're looking for. Um, uh, create an actor in relationship between. So, for example, here you would, for example, you would find the two different nodes. Just put the, the pattern that you're looking for. I'm looking for a node person with the name Tom Hanks and the movie with the title Apollo. And then you would just put variables to describe these things in front. And then you would say P acted in M and merge that. And you would have a relationship between those two nodes. Um, so I was telling you about ASCII art, right? And this is <laughs> this is... The, the, the query language in its essence, right? So you have these parentheses that, that represents a node. Uh, you have these dashes that, that, uh, and brackets that, that represent relationships. And you can put in a reference there if you want. So you can actually work with that data or return that data and stuff like that. And if you want to narrow the search or the, the query, uh, you can use labels as well on both uh, nodes and relationship types, and that you would do by just the column, right? And and uh, right, and you could use inline uh, labels and uh, no properties, but you could also use the where clause, right, to get uh, what you're trying to get out from your query. Um, all right, so I figured that I will show you a little bit of how this might look like. So if you sign up for Aura, uh, you can get one of these instances here. Uh, you basically just put the new instance type. And I've already created one, but here you can get one that's called AuraDB3. And if I go back to my instances here, um, you can open up something called Workspace. Uh, right now we have different ways of accessing the database. We have Neo4j Browser, and we have something called Neo4j Bloom. Uh, we're in the process of transitioning the original experience to this thing called Workspace. So basically, it's the same thing all in one, right? Uh, let me refresh that. Uh, 
So here we go. So for example, here you got a simple search bar and we might say uh, a person uh, that acted in movie. Uh, now let's see why it's not connected. All right, let me reconnect to this database. All right, it might be prompted like this as well. Uh, all right, so here we go. All right, so here is our data. So this is, in our workspace, this would constitute as Bloom, uh, which is our data exploration tool, right? This is what you might use to make presentations or uh, dive down into your data. And it has this kind of simple way of accessing things. So you could do like, you can go for movies or person in movies, or you can limit that to a relationship where you have movie, uh, things that have been acted in a movie, for example. So you might specify that query and you get all the data back. And then you can also go in here, do some filtering. You can add a filter that has, all right, we're looking for persons whose name is, is why different name? All right, let's do born then. You can specify the range that they are born in. And you apply that filter, right? And that will show you what part of the cluster is born within those years, right? And which movie they are played, uh, they play in. Uh, here we have the person filter that's on name, and we could maybe do Tom Hanks. All right, we have Tom Hanks there, and we apply that filter. Let's remove the other one. And we can see that here is Tom Hanks, and the connections to the movies that he played in. And there are a lot of other things you can do with this tool. And if you want to write, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Cypher queries directly, you can do that here. You can do match and movies uh, who, uh, let's say, acted in uh, and then person, perhaps. All right, and let's do P person, and then we would return person.name. And we get a list of all of that name, right? But if we omit the property of that, we would just get a cluster of all the nodes, right? And we can also do, uh, now I put M instead of M, that was unfortunate, but here we can put P and N, and we get back both the movies and the persons, right? And there's also a data importer here where you can work with importing data directly and mapping it to your graph and stuff like that. Very simple, very easy. Um, on the application side, so usually you have your data, uh, you got it into the database, and now you want to build something, right? So yes, you can actually use a driver to connect to the database, do your queries, build your REST APIs, your GRCP, or whatever. But one of the models that actually works re really well with uh, Neo4j is GraphQL. So we built out this GraphQL toolbox and a library that's called uh, Neo4j Graph Library uh, that will help you uh, get started with this, right? So with this toolbox, for example, I can just connect to the database, and I can do introspection on the database that will give me back so if i remove this for example that will give me back it will look into the database see what nodes and relationships you have in there and it will give me uh, a graphql uh, type definition that i can build into a schema and start querying so here we can so here we can go we can look at all right we're looking for movies release dates titles people who are acted in and when they were born a name, for example, and we can start querying that database. And it doesn't have to be much uh, more uh, harder than anything like that. So our type definitions for here, you might want to clean it up or prettify it or whatever. You can copy that, put it into your node or, or Python or whatever you want that's using GraphQL and start working with it uh, on your development environment.
uh, and here is also an example of sandbox where you would uh, where you can access the three day trial to get up and running with a lot of different uh, data sets that's already built in there. So we have, for example, we have the graph data science example. You can load in your own Twitter account thing and, and explore your own Twitter. Uh, we have um, we have a recommendations example, and these are also accompanied by browser guides that will walk you through the process, right? Uh, and a lot of other use cases here. And then there is also Graph Academy where you can start doing your courses and get familiar with the fundamentals and stuff like that. And we have, uh, and right. So this November, uh, we have a developer conference um, that's the 16th to the 17th of November. It's totally online and everything like that. So if you want to know more, uh, get deeper into what kind of use cases are out there, get to know graphs more. Usually there is some kind of certification path that you can go as well and kind of get certified in this different types of things. Um, we have this that we host, uh, Notes 2022. Uh, that is actually another page, but um, this is also our developer blog. where you can find a lot of tips and tricks and use cases and, and examples. Um, so I can recommend that as well. And um, also, I don't know, will you be sending out these slides? All right, all right. So in the slides, we have links to all of the uh, training things, the data sets, the, uh, the videos, the chat, the forum, the, um, the community, um, where we have people that are willing to answer your questions. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things going on in our community. So we have a lot of events, uh, event calendars. We have uh, other, a lot of resources that you can use if you want to know more. And I guess that opens it up for Q&A. Cool. Um, so I did ask the chat if there was any Tom Hanks fans. Sadly, <laughs> there was not. I don't know, maybe everyone went to I go have watch. I with Keanu Reeves. Right? Yeah, maybe. That's, that's good to people going. Uh, but there were some questions. Um, is a graph database related to digital twin mapping? Well, that is one of our use cases. Uh, I'm not that familiar with it, but if they were to send me an email or something like that, I could uh, pair them up with somebody that's working on uh, digital twins. But I know there are people out there that uh, are doing those kind of use cases with this, for sure. Got it. The other question was, can you please define what index-free adjacency is? All right. So, for example, when you have a database, right, and... and um, so the way that you find data entries in your database is usually through an index or some kind of mapping between uh, between entities, right? And a database, when it's when it's um, trying to compute these relationships, it has to actually uh, use processing power to find out where these relationships are, right? And that's how you would do it in an SQL database. Uh, but we don't have to do that compute because we already know exactly where on disk or in memory uh, we're trying to access this other node, right? So we don't have to do a lookup to actually follow one of the uh, the, uh, uh, the relationships, and that gives us co if you're familiar with uh, with complexity and stuff like that, that gives us constant time traversing one of these relationships instead of trying to scan big tables to see if everything matches with that relationship or not. Any questions from the live audience? Thank you. I uh, just want to say that I'm not a back-end developer, but it's super excited anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, so uh, my question is, uh, for these properties, are, yep. what kind of data types are supported? Uh, wow. I mean, all the primary data types are there, like in strings, uh, stuff like that. We have we have time, we have uh, date time. So basically, the easy way to describe it is uh, we have the Java data types. <laughs> right? Uh, it's built on Java, so we have a translation between all of those uh, those types. Um, there are 
uh, ways of getting you spatial things in there. For example, there are ways of uh, getting, you know, but um, natively, uh, there's a set that we support. I think they are all in, uh, if you just Google me for J data types, uh, I think there should be a table. Uh, all right, so here we have the property types. Uh, we have numbers, links, booleans, points would be the spatial type, and then we have the temporal types that are here. Oh, no. Oh, online. All right. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, there we go. All right. So these would be the property types. Um, we have numbers, strings, booleans, uh, spatial uh, type is called point. I think that is new, actually. That allows you to index on, on, on uh, points and stuff like that. And with the, the temporal types, date time, local time, date time, local time, uh, and duration. Cool. Thank you. I got another question. I should have asked it. So um, when you query other, quote unquote, normal, or like other NoSQL or SQL databases, there is, uh, as far as I know, uh, you know how much time that's going to take, uh, Some usually. Uh, I'm, and here we're working with this complexities, and uh, is it ever the case that uh, you you query something and it turns out like that, uh, you can see that uh, it takes approximately the same time that all of a sudden it sort of spirals out of control because, oh, here's like a super complex relationship and that becomes a problem uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of time. I mean, I think the, uh, I'm not an expert in this field, I would say. But uh, so, for example, if you're traversing um, with these different type of algorithms, like shortest path and things like that, there are implemented counters that will check that if you walk the same path or not. And uh, so it will, if it says that, oh, all right, this algorithm allows you to traverse the same thing twice, all right, but Usually there's like a number that you would say that, all right, you only allow to uh, traverse this this many times or or there's a timeout. There's a global time, timeout as well for your queries. But um, <clears throat> I mean, that is, you can do a lot before you have to time out. Let's just say that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, could you please elaborate a bit more in terms of data modeling when you model something as a relationship and when you um, add an information as a label? So in your example, you had, for example, the person which had an email address, which was a label in your case. Right. But um, so so. Um, Usually the labels are used to describe a category or a role or something like that of a node. Uh, so for example, let's pull up, uh, I got arrows.app here, for example. Um, oh, all right. <laughs> Well, it's tired. Uh, all right, but so for example, let's say that you have um, usually a node is an instance, right? So an instance might be like like um, Max or you, for example. But you know that both of us are persons, right? But instead of using a table and conforming yourself to a box or whatever you want to call it, you label yourself as a person, and that is what represents you as a person, right? And you might be a person, but you might also be, for example, a teacher. So you can hold both the label person and teacher. And then you would be able to query and match on either uh, person or label or both, right? So, for example, you might just be looking for persons and, te that are persons and teachers. And you can just put another colon on your... Um, on your um, on your uh, query to specify that, um, so it's a it's a way of 
enumerating your nodes, I would say. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it it's basically related to performance. So let's say, would you rather put it, uh, nodes that are, have the property of being a person and some of them have a label job and is teacher or would you add another node that has the property job and you would like put from every person who is a teacher a relationship to the node, basically, and what is more efficient when querying this? Well, so the thing is that like the relationships between all of these things are usually uh, are, are stored on disk, right? So, so, so traversing them is pretty much pretty trivial, right? So, you know, splitting it up as a job and a person would make a lot of sense, right? So you might have a job and you might have a relationship that says works for, or works with, or or uh, has job or something like that, right? And you would just you would just query a person who has a job and then you get that back. Uh, so you were talking about like performance and things like that. And when you execute a query, there are statistics in the background that does all of uh, the optimizations and stuff like that. And you have your, usually you anchor on something and you traverse from that anchor. So for example, if I say a person that's name is Tom Hanks, right? You will look for that Tom Hanks node and it will start traversing from that node for example so it would so instead of scanning like looking through uh, the whole index of people it would just explore all the relationships to see if it's connected to something that you're looking for right so basically the traversal becomes much more performant but does it need to traverse a relationship to know what to which node it is connected, or does it know kind of know this in advance? Well, in in in, uh, in when we're talking about graphs, we usually talk about traversing the graph. But what's actually happening is just a dereferencing, right? We're looking at a space in disk, basically, or in memory, depends on how big of a cache and heap and stuff like that you've set up, but. Yes. So along this line, uh, sorry if I annoy the people, but it's it's quite interesting because we have a, a use case for this. Um, so if if I have a node which yeah. has let's say one billion relationships, right, and I would like to know or just like the job of this person, can I very efficiently just traverse to the job, or does it really? need to go through this one billion relationships to check which relationship connects to the job node oh now you're talking very low level um let me think about that for a second so basically a node is stored as a record and then you have um, um i might not be able to answer that but um, it's okay. We can go <laughs> chat. After. I can get back to you with an yeah. answer if you it's, just send me a message, right? It's late as well, so yeah. we, we, we forget. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last question. It's also very specific. Um, Michael, who came late, work from home Zoom. No worries, Michael. Um, we would like to reference any training docs or SQL coding because he's looking to create Monte Carlo simulations to do matching or closely correlated currency pairs. I don't know if that's a use case that you have uh, heard of, but I'll just give it to you, and then if um, not, we can follow up. But. Well, I'll tell you this much. I worked with Monte Carlo simulations, but that was a very long time ago. <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I can't answer that. Yeah, okay. Uh, Database is scratch. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll connect you with the right people. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone, and thanks, everyone, on the, uh, the stream for joining. I hope you're mental databases that haven't been overloaded with so much information uh that's my last dash joke last dad joke of the night uh we do have like a, for everyone here um the meetups also related to sql and working with data coming up and if you're on the stream please check out our meetup group uh, we'll have all those posted and for the people here at home uh, we have tons of swag so please take some there's nothing sadder than coming home <laughs> back home with a, a bag of swag that you meant to give out so there's socks stickers, hand sanitizer, completely useful stuff. So really great. But uh, yeah, have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you for having us.